of what Putin did, an act of war, or what he did was wrong, that doesn't mean the United States should go in and what liberate that part of Ukraine, like we liberated Afghanistan, like we liberated Iraq, like we liberated Vietnam. I mean, this is this is ridiculous. So much about this stuff about decolonization and you know this stuff about critiquing white people or whatever and, and Europeans. Here you have a situation of all of the the guilty world, right? Europe uniting under the banner of NATO against Russia, which is in semi-Asiatic country to the east. I mean, the irony is incredible. So the leftists, the same ones that have been telling us for so long that, oh, the problem uh, is uniquely some kind of European guilt, are rallying behind a kind of pan-European supremacist uh, uh, renaissance, uh, the revival of neo-Nazism, basically, against Russia and now also against China. I mean, it's not simply an irony. We should draw a fundamental conclusion from this. And for me, that conclusion is that uh, the so-called American left in its entirety cannot be redeemed uh, whatsoever. Uh, it's not simply that we can build something from scratch, but we should cease to see leftists as a reservoir from which we should attempt to draw support. The support for anyone who's interested in a real initiative to oppose the status quo is going to come from people who are either apolitical or who are right wing. But as far as leftists are concerned, I say we owe them nothing. We owe them absolutely no attention. We have no reason to pander to them or to sacrifice our language or the manner of the way in which we present ourselves to them. We should stop walking on eggshells around them. We don't need this acute minority of parasites on the working people of this country. saying that we're proposing $33 billion to be sent to Ukraine rather than being sent to solving problems that we have here. Like, we have children that are starving. We have people who are unemployed. Uh, I, I keep feeling like I'm reading the same headline over and over. It's like uh, every week, President Biden approves another $1 billion for Ukraine. And then I check the dates, and it's just every week is a new billion dollars for Ukraine. And I just don't see how it connects to helping Americans' lives better. You no, know, we have got this new disinformation czar who is basically, her job is to now help disinform the public. You know, this is a conflict that's been going on for eight years and since 2014 when we cooed the Ukrainian government and uh, basically helped install these fanatically anti-Russian Nazis uh, who collaborated with the Nazis during World War II. Uh, and, you know, uh, there's an entire generation of children in the Donbass who have had to grow up in basements because uh, of the constant bombardment that's killed, you know, 16,000 people. So Russia's really trying to end this conflict at this point. I mean, Russia's like the, I think it's one of the biggest exporters of uh, wheat in the whole world. Same thing with Ukraine. Ukraine's also a major exporter. And uh, the conflict, um, which the Azovite Nazis started in Ukraine, it's, it's going to wreak devastation um, on Africa, Asia, and even coming here. There is so much work that needs to be done. Like on the way here, I was driving and I had to dodge so many potholes. Why don't we create more jobs on filling those potholes? Or better yet, why don't we join the Belt and Road Initiative and we partner with China to build high-speed railways so that it would only take me, like, not even, not even half as much time to get to D.C. It seems like a vanity project for billionaires, uh, people who support NATO and, and are totally out of touch with people who live in the land of America. Um, so I, I don't support whatsoever. They're, they said in 2008, that uh, Georgia and Ukraine joining NATO would be a red line. It, he's been saying it for years. Putin expired every diplomatic option before he started this counteroffensive. And so people really need to get the facts about what's motivating uh, this conflict. I filled up my gas today. Uh, <laughs> the local ga gas station near me was just under $4, which I was super happy about a couple weeks ago, and now it's back up to $4.25. And you just have these smug liberals telling you that that's, that's what you have to do as a working person to support our war in Ukraine. And I, I do think of it as, as being essentially a proxy war between America. It's, it's, not, it's not aid 
um, it's rocket launchers, and we're giving them to Nazis, so, you know, it, uh, the rising costs really do hurt. The infiltration of uh, pro-war propaganda is, is really just seeping into all aspects of high school, and it's, it's really scary, and uh, I, that's what sign is here to combat. We are not radicals. We are revolutionaries. Right. We are not rebels without a cause. We are proletarians with a vision. Sending $33 billion uh, for more for war. My question is, where are we going to get the money? Where are we going to get the money for that? I'm really concerned about this, um, this spending on the military when we've got uh, tents all over the place in Washington, D.C. We've got our infrastructure falling apart. We've got a student loan crisis. We've got a health healthcare uh, crisis. We've got all sorts of problems that we could better be using that money. $20 billion could theoretically solve the homelessness crisis in this country. Uh, so we should really take care of our own problems instead of uh, giving $33 billion more dollars to this Nazi regime to try to help them start World War III. War in Ukraine, stoked in part by NATO expansion beyond the borders of a unified Germany, violating promises made to Moscow at the end of the Cold War, now looks set to become a lengthy war of attrition, one funded and backed by an increasingly bellicose United States. Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin, after a visit to Kiev, declared that, quote, we want to see Russia weakened to the degree that it can't do the kinds of things it has done in Ukraine. Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi, during her own trip to Kiev, said that America will, quote, stand with Ukraine until victory is won. The Biden administration has requested another $33 billion in emergency military and economic aid, half of what Russia spent on its military in 2021 for Ukraine, a package congressional Democrats plan to increase by $7 billion. And this is on top of the $13.6 billion already allocated for Ukraine. The total U.S. troop numbers in Central and Eastern Europe has been increased to more than 100,000. Biden has signed into law a modern-day Lend-Lease Act waiving time-consuming requirements to fast-track weapons to Ukraine. What will be the consequences of the U.S. fueling this proxy war? How will Russia respond to the U.S. targeting of a dozen Russian generals for assassination and providing the intelligence to sink the Moskva, the guided missile cruiser that was the flagship of the Russian Black Sea Fleet? What will the war mean for the United States, Europe, and Russia? Could it escalate into an open confrontation between the United States and Russia? Why are the same cabal of generals and politicians that drain the state of trillions of dollars in the debacles in Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, Libya, and Somalia, and learn nothing from the nightmare of Vietnam once again, able to push the United States closer and closer towards another conflict? 